It's good to see everybody. Uh, feels like it's been a long time, a long time since we've been shut in in this uh, weird world situation that we're in. And it was really nice to hear what everybody was uh, thankful for. Um, it's an easy question for me, obviously, having a, a five-week-old. Um, seeing her birth was one of the most incredible things I've ever experienced. I actually wasn't going to look, but I think, I don't know if the instant came from God, but I looked down and I was filled with gratefulness. Starting to get a little bit emotional. It's hard to look at my daughter and not just be moved by just the incredible gift. So tonight we'll be looking at the book of Ecclesiastes in uh, chapter 5, uh, verses 18 to 20. The book of Ecclesiastes was written by um, someone called the preacher. He doesn't clearly identify himself within the book, but we generally attribute it to Solomon. Uh, Solomon, who was the son of David, he was the, possibly the greatest king in Israel, at least in terms of wealth and wisdom. God really blessed Solomon, um, and he was known in the whole region for the riches that he had and his wisdom. This book is for all of us. Um, it is a book that is part of uh, what, what is known as wild, wisdom literature. It is um, knowledge, wisdom that the author wanted to record for the people of God. But the book of Ecclesiastes is a bit different from the book of Proverbs, for example. Um, it is often considered to be negative because a lot of what is inside is, sounds negative. And I think the purpose of that, the purpose, purpose of the book of Ecclesiastes was to relay a fundamental message in a very unapologetic and unambiguous way. So the author used strong language because he wants us to know that life is utterly meaningless without God. There is absolutely no value in life without God. He does this by talking about life under the sun. What is under the sun? Everything. Um, and absolutely everything on earth. And he does this so that we can relate to what he's saying in our own personal experience. We can see with our own eyes the merit of what he's saying. This specific passage that we're looking at today is within a broader passage that is a warning about wealth and honor. Um, it tells us that those that seek it never, are never satisfied. If you're seeking money, there'll never be enough money. If you seek power, there'll never be enough power. It's just a continuous, futile exercise. But this specific passage that sits in the middle shows us that what wisdom actually instructs us to do. So I'm going to read from it now, and then we'll go, we'll go through it. So verse 18 to 20 in chapter 5. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. So we're called to be grateful for what we have because this is God's gift. But let's unpack this, unpack this wisdom um, one section at a time. So firstly, we look at this, the, the way the verse starts is, behold, this is what I have seen, to be good and fitting. So if we think of this being King Solomon, we know he's a man of means. He had everything that he could possibly want. He has seen everything under the sun. And this is the, the weight with which he's saying these words. I've seen everything, and this is what I've seen to be good for people. This is what I've seen to be fitting for humans. And 
this follows a section in which he's talking about the futile exercises that men engage in. There's a lot of them. The whole book is full of, of chasing after the wind, chasing after vapor. Vanity of vanity, vapor of vapors. It's something that cannot be grasped, no matter how much you chase after it. And he's saying, this is what I've seen to be good. So what is good and fitting? The first verse tells us to eat and drink. So it is to enjoy what we have, enjoy what God has granted us, what we have in our own lives, where we live, um, the family we have, the things that we have. It is good to enjoy them, as opposed to accumulating, as opposed to hoarding, as opposed to keeping it because it gives us status. This is not to say that you have to spend every penny you have. You can still be wise with your funds, but it is a question of not focusing on these things as the, the, the place in which we find meaning. These things are given to us by God for enjoyment. And then it says, find enjoyment in all of your toil under the sun. This is a, this is a harder one, right? Because we can all enjoy a nice meal. Uh, we can all enjoy a laugh with a family. But enjoying our job is, is a challenge. This is a particular challenge for my generation where, you know, we grew up with society telling us we could be whatever we wanted to be. And a lot of jobs nowadays are very... In a way, it's abstract. You know, I've always had a tr all of the jobs I had, I always had a bit of a struggle to describe what I did because I wasn't a carpenter. I never, was never a fireman. Um, so it, it becomes difficult to enjoy our work. Uh, and I'm sure this was the same thing when you were a farmer in the Middle Ages and you were toiling the land that you probably didn't even own. Can't imagine that that was easy to rejoice in. But in his wisdom, God is trying to tell us that this is a good thing, to enjoy our work. This was part of the initial, revel the initial creation. Adam was to work in the garden. The difference between then and now is the fall. So while work was enjoyable naturally then, it has become difficult due to the fall but we're still to enjoy it because it's our portion from God. And we are to enjoy all of our work, not just the parts that we like, not just maybe one job that's really um, fitting with our interests, but enjoying it from God. I, in my work experience, I've had different jobs, and I found a strong link between how much I was able to rejoice in my job and how grateful I was. Some things are simple. I took a big step forward in my career, and I was rejoicing in my work, in my job. That was easy. Uh, or I had great colleagues that I wanted to see every day. It's easy to rejoice in that. But this is telling us that we are to rejoice in all our work because it, it changes the, the perspective. You know, it's not about the job and what the job can give us, but it is for, from God. You see, the, the, this passage tells us you know, we are to enjoy, eat, drink, find enjoyment at work, because this is what's given to us by God. We spend a few years on this earth, and it's easy to get distracted and forget how this is a very small segment of eternity. This is a very small time that we spend here. And, and this is what God has allotted us for this time. So we are to enjoy it. And all that we have, it isn't because we earned it. We don't enjoy things because we've worked hard. We, you know, it, it's not because we've ne networked well. It's not because we applied for the right job and did well in an interview or any other reason why we might feel like it is because of something that we did that we can enjoy what we have. It is all from God. From the beginning, labor was part of our lives. So if we understand this, if we understand that everything is from God, if we understand that our family is from God, our, our money is from God, our job is from God, 
it has to change our perspective. The only thing that makes sense at this point is for us to be grateful. That is the wise thing to do. You see, the perfect shepherd, the creator of, our, of the whole universe, has given all that you have. He has given it to you. Though so you're a sinner and deserve absolutely nothing. A, a sermon that really impacted my life from John Piper made me realize that. Really, as sinners since the fall, all we deserve is destruction. So anything that we get, it is from God, it is not our doing. It is grace that we receive. We must move away from any sense of entitlement. I worked hard for all these years, I should have something. We must move away from being consumed by striving for things. You know, I just want to accumulate more. You know, I get so many social media posts, I don't know why it comes up on my feed, but about, you know, investing. Be, be the quiet person. Don't, don't go out. Don't, don't spend time with people. Just work hard and invest your money so you can be a millionaire. That is, again, futile. That might happen, but it's not going to bring you joy. You see, all of the instructions in the Bible are God-centric. It is God that provides this thing. It is to him that we go and ask for things. It is not, it never tells us that we're to find it ourselves. We, it comes from him. And if we don't have what we need, it's because we haven't asked with faith. So what does this grateful lo life look like? We have a great example in Paul. While he was in prison in Rome, he wrote to the Philippians and said, I'm paraphrasing. I have learned to be happy with having a lot, having a little. His life was dedicated to God. Christ was the center of his life. And that allowed him to be grateful with whatever he had, to be happy with whatever he had, to be content and have joy in his life. Now, some people are clearly given more. Some people are blessed with wealth. wealth. Some people are not. So... This is what the next passage, I think, is addressing. Verse 19. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. Everyone also. This tells us the same thing applies, and it's even repeated in the latter part of the verse. doesn't matter if you have a lot or if you have little. This, we have to be grateful for what we have. We have to enjoy it. There's warnings against the, the man that has the wealth and keeps it to himself. He just loses it all. But you see, those that are given wealth are given it by God. We have this false perspective sometimes that people that don't have is because they don't work hard enough. People that have a lot, um, they work for it. Or, or that this idea that if we work and work and work and work, it leads to wealth and security, which is, it's not a, it's not a greedy intent. It's still a positive intent to want to have security for your family. But we have this false perspective. I mean, some people work really hard and still don't get rich. Because the only security comes from God. It doesn't come from possession. It doesn't come from work. It doesn't come from money. So whether you have a little or a lot, that's what we need to do. Be grateful. And I want to give some perspective on poverty. There is true poverty in the world. So my dad, my dad, is, my dad repeats things a lot. Um, I feel like he's kind of run out of, a, of new additions to his repertoire, but he repeats a lot of the same things. But one of the things that comes up regularly is this footage that he's seen on the news one day. And it was really tragic. Um, I can't remember exactly from what country it was, uh, if it was some country in Africa or Myanmar, but essentially a fourth world country. And these people were sifting through dirt so that they could find seeds to eat because they had nothing to eat. So true poverty exists. But... Sometimes our notion of poverty 
is, is due to expectation. Because sometimes we don't have as much as others, but we're not necessarily poor. Um, most likely, if you live in this country today, you're in the f top 5% richest people in the world, which is hard to wrap your head around. And it's easy in the Western society, there's, it's, material possessions are very important here, and that I'm successful is very important. It's, it's easy to think we cannot rejoice in what we have because we're poor. And, I, and I've, I've had this perception. I grew up, my parents were missionaries in Italy, and we were not wealthy. My parents were considered low income. But you know, I had, I always had food. My stomach was always full. I always had clothes. Um, I was able to go to elementary school, middle school, high school. I had the PlayStation 1. I had the PlayStation 2. I uh, was able to go to college. See, I don't remember at any point going outside in the dirt to find seeds. But I have definitely referred to myself as poor. Why? Because we were not middle class. I didn't always have the latest phone. I didn't have flashy clothes. I, was, I had less than what my friends had in terms of material possessions. And it is tragic that I had the audacity to refer myself as poor when there's people that literally have nothing. It's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of expectations. You see, you grow up in school and you think everyone's the same, so you think if that person can afford something, I should be able to afford something. I mean, I had kids in middle school that had shoes that were 100 bucks. I could never buy those shoes. I never had them. And was I sad about it? Yes, I was, of course. I wanted to fit in. But I was never poor. I had plenty to rejoice in my family, in what God has given me, in the experiences that I had. You know, that kid that had the $100 shoes, his parents were separated. It's easy to, to get distracted by that. But what I want to point out in this verse is the second part that the author refers to as God's gift. It is not the wealth, it is not the possessions, but it's the power to enjoy them. That's God's gift. Not lots of money, not a nice house, not a dream job, not a big family, but it's the ability to enjoy it. This is the focus of this passage. The important part is to be able to enjoy it. Because possessions in themselves are, are nothing. I, uh, I went on a trip to Cuba a few years ago. Again, see, not poor. Uh, I went to a trip to Cuba a few years ago, and I came across some unexpected wisdom. We, uh, we made friends with some people there. They took us scuba diving. Um, it was relatively cheap scuba diving for us, and it was a really high-end experience with, with a really, really experienced diver. He couldn't even tell us how many dives he'd done. And we really felt confident to put our lives in this man's hands. He was really experienced. But after a while that we bonded, they asked us you know, about our lives in London. London, global city. You know, in Cuba, you don't hear that much about the outside, but you would still know that London is a wealthy city, it's a prosperous city, it's, it's a successful a place where a lot of successful people are. And they asked us, you know, how much money we weighed and how, what things we had. They were very curious and, and somewhat jealous. These people are really poor. This person that had an extremely specialized, high-level skill, he spent his weekends free diving, fishing, not to sell it to make money, to feed his family, because he did not have enough of an income to feed his family. Unfortunately, the situation in Cuba is it's very drastic, there's a big black market. So this man was forced to fish every Sunday, every Saturday, had just about enough to get by. And he asked us, you know, how much we made. But then he also asked us, you know, about our lifestyle. You know, what things do you do in London? Can you go and talk, up to, talk to people? How are people like? And we told him, you know, if you've ever been to London, you might probably not know this because you would have gone as a tourist, but having lived there, and my wife found that this out from just being there for a, for a short time, 
when you're traveling on the London Underground, you're not supposed to make eye contact with people. That's very rude. I mean, I don't think anything actually happens, except from people like maybe huffing and puffing and um, being upset with you, being annoyed, but not, again, not vocalizing it because they're not talking to you. You know, that's the whole purpose of not making eye contact so I don't have to talk to you. So if you make eye contact and I talk, you win. So I'm not gonna do it. But it's a big no-no, and there's a lot of things like that. You know, you have to, you, you don't talk to strangers. It's a very lonely city. It's one of the loneliest places in the world, in fact, if you, if you listen to the polls. When they found this out, they said, you can keep your money. We, we don't want the money if we're going to give up the life that we have, life of poverty. But they were able to enjoy it. And it was really an unexpected piece of wisdom that also made complete sense. Material possessions don't, don't give anything in themselves. They were telling us, you know, they drink a lot of rum in Cuba because they make it there. And he was saying, you know, what we do is we just take a bottle of rum, go to our friend's house, and, and just have a drink together. And I, I got to tell him, that's very rare in London. So he was like, you can keep it. <laughs> so what happens when we are able to enjoy what we have, when we are grateful for what we have, when we rejoice in our toiling? See, this is when this passage takes a really interesting turn. For he will not much remember the days of his life, because God keeps him occupied with the joys in his heart. Wow. So if you're able to focus away from trying to find happiness in your material possession, if you focus on being grateful for what you have, this is basically telling us that we're not even going to remember what happened because we'll be so busy being joyful in God. Because the focus now becomes the giver, right? We're thankful for what we have because we receive it out of nothing, out of not, no, nothing deserved. We receive it by grace, and we're grateful. It turns our focus on the giver. We will not remember the things, the specific details of what happened. It doesn't say don't remember anything, but don't remember much of it because we'll be too busy with this joy in our hearts. We'll be too joyful, and I believe that. Have you ever met people like that? I feel like my grandma was, is like that. She is, my daughter's middle name is Giovanna, named after her. She's one of the most pious, people I've ever met, which also links with my daughter's name, which is Pia, which means pious. And my grandma is a great example. You never hear her complain about things. I know, for example, that when she was younger, she was working too hard in service of God. She was cooking for a lot of people, and she had a miscarriage because of that. I never heard her mention it. You wouldn't know from the joy that is clearly in her heart. That's always been a great witness in my life, and that's why I wanted to recognize it by naming my daughter after her. Because when we focus on the giver, which is what my grandma does, we're filled with joy. He's just so great, isn't he? Someone said, I'm grateful for the Lord. Amen. So if we're focusing on how good God is, we can't help but be grateful. If we don't hold to this expectation that we're supposed to have things, if we don't hold this, this idea that having possessions and wealth is what's going to bring us joy, we're going to find real joy in God. And I thought it was kind of funny that you mentioned joy, <laughs> having joy in God, having a party with God, even if no one else is there. That's wonderful. So a little while ago, I saw this um, video. Uh, it's a collection of videos, actually. It's one of those uh, Jimmy Kimmel YouTube challenges. I don't know if you've heard of them, but basically, he issues a challenge and parents do things to their kids that are really funny. Um, so 
the most common one is one where they tell their kids on the night after all, the day after Halloween that they ate all their candy, and the reactions vary. But this one challenge was to let their children open one gift for Christmas early, a few weeks early. But what they had to do was give them a really terrible gift. And obviously, it's really, really funny. But as you can imagine, the, the reactions vary dramatically. Um, a lot of kids are confused. It's like, what is this? Some get really angry, especially boys that receive girly stuff, which is interesting, especially when it's a Barbie. There's been a couple of those, and those were pretty funny. But they, they then yell things at their parents, I hate you, you know, you're the worst. But then I remember this video with these two girls, and what they received was avocados. And you wouldn't be, if you were just to look at their face, you would have no idea that what they got was avocado. They didn't even know what they were. Like the parents asked them, do you know what that is? No. It's an avocado. Ah, oh, great. See, what I think is the other kids, their focus was on the gift. Their focus was on what they expected they deserved. Their joy was based on what they would receive. But in those two girls, I'm convinced that their joy was in the giver. The gift was from their parents. So they were happy with whatever they got. And I think that's a great, great testament. We can learn so much from children. My wife pointed out a while ago, children are easily, a, a way to easily understand our own spiritual lives, because we're, Spiritually, we're offering like children. It takes time to mature. It takes work and the Holy Spirit. Um, so I thought that was a really great illustration to, to show this difference of attitude, different of, difference of perspective, this, how we can be ungrateful or grateful. See, the, the preacher here tells us that it is wise to be grateful for what we have because it is from God and that this will bring us true joy. So it is wise, and it has a positive outcome for us. And this starts from Jesus' sacrifice. Our ability to have this relationship with God, this relationship with the giver, was, was, made, was possible thanks to Jesus' sacrifice. So that's the first gift that we all receive, that we're all given whether we accept it or not. And that is a huge gift. Imagine, you deserve destruction. You got grace. Do you really want to focus on the little things that you may or may not have? I mean, I really like a Tesla, but I'm trying hard not to focus on that. The gift that we all receive, no matter gender, race, wherever, time, is immeasurable. That should consume our thoughts. That should consume our hearts. Let us not be distracted by material things or things that we believe we're owed. And let us not get distracted by envy. We live in a, in a really varied country. Some people are run, go, driving around in Teslas and much nicer cars. Let us not distracted, get distracted by, by either striving to also have those things ourselves because that is not a life worth living. Or be maybe just consumed with anger and resentment. See, there's another video of two brothers. So it's, it's apparent from the video that the, the first kid was expecting a Nintendo, a Nintendo 3DS. As likely when it was released, so probably the fanciest um, little gaming system. And what his terrible present was a string with the letters 3DS. And his parents, see, you, you got your 3DS. Needless to say, he was very angry. He said, you know, this is not what I wanted. This is, I wanted the, the, the gaming thing. This is not it. This is a stupid gift. And he was so angry. And the brother, see, he, he got a potato 
a raw potato. And the parents were saying, you know, here you go, Mr. Potato Head. Which is obviously not Mr. Potato Head, because it's literally just a raw potato. But this kid was holding it with such joy. You know, he was grinning and smiling. He was so happy, holding it with his hands like these. And obviously the other kid was saying to their parents, I hate you, you're the worst. But what he was able to say at that point was, I got the worst gift. Okay, plausible. He got the best. Imagine thinking the best gift you can receive is a raw potato. Imagine thinking as a kid, being so consumed with what, how disappointed you are by what you received, being so consumed with what you, what you should have received, what you were owed, what you expected, that you think that a kid getting a potato is the best thing in the world. But that's what happens when we're focused on, on other things, on other people's possessions and what they got. You see what the boy really envied was the other boy's attitude. There's no way in hell or in heaven or on earth that he could really envy the potato. He could have got a potato. He could have probably knows where potatoes are, go in the kitchen, get one. No, probably my theory is that what he was envious of was the boy's attitude. Another great illustration from children, at least if I say so myself. Uh, so be grateful for what you have because it is God's gift. Might hate the job that you have, might be struggling with it. And God is always open for us to go and ask him. Always, always there to listen to us. He's available. He's a, he's a God that wants a personal relationship with us. But let not, that not take away from the gratefulness. Even Jesus said, you know, if it's possible, take this cup away from me. But he, he accepted it. So if he accepted the fate that he knew was coming, we can accept a period of our lives with maybe more, less than we would like. And I have three takeaways for you today. It's always three for some reason. I think three is the magic number. Um, number one, enjoy what God has blessed you with. Be like Paul. Learn to be content with a little or a lot. See, if God blesses you with a lot, that's not bad in itself. See, people say money is the root of all evil, and some people say, no, it's greed. Well, it's a combination of both. If you have money, it's more likely that you're greedy. You're not going to be greedy for your seed in the dirt. But that's the problem, is your attitude. The stuff that is given to you is for you to enjoy. So don't focus on whatever on what you don't have. Don't be consumed by acquiring or accumulating or hoarding what you have. You, did, you deserve nothing of it anyways. It's all given by grace. Number two, find joy in your toil. Embrace whatever job you have given from the perspective that it is from God. Work hard, do your best, not so that your career may progress, but so that you honor God. He has given you this. It's like the parable of the talents, right? Work, use what you have to the best, make the most of it, because it's what God gave you. Last takeaway is rejoice in the giver. Be thankful for Jesus' sacrifice. Focus on, what, on God as the source of all your blessings. And if you're an unbeliever today, I just want to tell you that you too can enjoy this relationship with God. You can, too can find joy in submitting to God. You don't have to pursue things aimlessly. You don't have to let life frustrate you. Come to God. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you for everything that you've done for us, everything that you've given us. And I want to repent for all the times that we have been ungrateful for all the things that you've given us. Let us live a life that is grateful, that is focused on you as our salvation, as our giver of blessing, as our God. Pray that you really strengthen us 
when we're facing challenges of not having quite as much as we need to be comfortable, or the challenges of having too much in a way that corrupts us. I really pray, pray that you bless those people today. In Jesus' name, amen.